Well, I am sorry to have missed being with you uh, last week and uh, had just a few days of not feeling well with some fever and chills and that, and that sort of thing. But now I'm back to uh, feeling uh, warm, not because I'm sick, but rather because it's finally just really, really hot outside. But um, I am thank thankful, Tim. Thank you, Tim, for filling in uh, for me last week. As we continue in our series, our title today is Wisdom for Living a Constructive Life. This is the sixth out of uh, six weeks of looking at the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, after the opening week of introductions um, about the endless cycles of life, about the, the follies of living in a, in a fallen world, we took three weeks where we looked at myths that are prominent themes in the book, the myth of uh, permanence, the myth of, of, of happiness and joy and the abundance of riches, the myth of uh, a sense of entitlement, the, the Miss and uh, and and then we missed the fifth week, of course, last week. But I'll put that together this week with some Solomonic type of advice about how to live well even in a crumbling world. Now, as we've reminded you throughout the series of Ecclesiastes, there's one word in particular that we need to kind of review each week to make sure we get a handle on that because. If you don't understand that word, it seems kind of like pretty weird, some of the things that, that Solomon is writing. So he jumps right into his main theme in the first verse of the book where he says that life is meaningless, that all is meaningless. Again, this Hebrew word, hebel, hebel, it would be like H-E-B-E-L, to transliterate it to, to English. It's a word that uh, it's vanity in the King James Version, futility is the way that it's uh, translated in some other versions. The idea of it, again, is that it's a breath. It's a vapor, like uh, the, the vapor your where you breathe on a glass, a cold glass, and you see it, but then it fades away. Life is like that. Or when a, a cold day, and you breathe, and you, and you see it, and, but then it, it, quickly, it quickly fades and is gone. Um, I liked what I read as another commentator uh, translated the word with this, poof, poof. You know, that's kind of like, poof, that's the idea of the air. It's, it's there, and then it's gone. So figuratively, the word is used to talk about the transitory, temporary, passing nature of life, how so many things of life, they come, and they're, they're quickly, just quickly gone. Thirty-five times in this book, Solomon uses, um, uses this word. And so, um, life indeed does go by quickly. You know, it seems like only just uh, a little more than a handful of years. Maybe it feels a little bit like maybe a decade or so ago that uh, Diana and I had been married for uh, just over a year. And on Memorial Day weekend of 1978, so yes, 40 years ago this weekend, and I was thinking about it this morning, I looked up the date, and this was a Friday, uh, this date of uh, that weekend, and uh, we would have probably, right about this hour of the day, been driving down Interstate 81, moving from uh, New Jersey, from the Allentown, New, Jer in, in New Jersey area, and moving down to, uh, to live in Dallas, Texas, where we would be for five years. So we're going down to 81, and the first place we stopped for gas was in Winchester, Virginia. And so we got gas. My father-in-law was helping us move. He had a full-size van, and he was pulling a trailer with a lot of our stuff. And I was following along in my very, very, very cool uh, 1968 Rambler Rebel station wagon with wood trim sidings. I mean, it was real. You guys would love it. It was really cool. You, 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 Lily, you'd want one of these. You really would. All right. <laughs> yeah. No, you wouldn't. No. And uh, so. We're, we got the gas, we're getting, we're, we're getting ready to go southbound on 81, and uh, my father-in-law pulls, he pulls to go on the ramp, and the van kept going toward the ramp, but at that point, the trailer came loose, and it went straight up the road by itself, and it was going up over the overpass while he went by. And I thought, I guess I better follow the trailer. So I followed the trailer. And one of my enduring memories of my father-in-law was that day. And I remember looking over and seeing him at the driver's seat. And he just... 
like that as he watched the trailer pass him on his left. So he got up to a spot where it was starting to come back down. I just kind of went up and I bumped it and I held it there. And a very, very nice truck driver came along with a block and all of that, and he helped us and got it. Somehow we got it reattached. I don't even know how that happened. And, but we had, so that, that's the first of a series of bad experiences with Winchester, Virginia in my life. But uh, I don't know what it is. Winchester and I don't, don't get along. But um, we uh, had flat tires. We had all these different experiences, but finally we got, we got to Dallas, and I remember pulling into Dallas and stopping, and I just burst into tears. I was so nervous about the whole moving experience. It had been such an ordeal. That's 40 years ago, and now four decades later, after 38 years of completely uninterrupted pastoral staff ministry in three churches, five sons, 3.9 daughters-in-law, it'll be four in a month, uh, 10 grandchildren, three houses built and owned, and probably about 20 cars, we can still say that we are in the land of the living. The land of the living. That phrase is actually a misnomer. When John Owen, the great Puritan uh, theologian and writer, lay on his deathbed, he told his secretary to write a note to a friend. And he started out by saying, I am still in the land of the living. But then he stopped. And he said, change that. Change that and say, I am yet in the land of the dying, but I hope soon to be in the land of the living. This isn't the land of the living. This is the land of the dying, that the curse is upon all living creatures due to sin, the curse of death. And, and Solomon making observation of the outworking of that curse is what generated so much of what Ecclesiastes is about and why his tone in Ecclesiastes often has sort of a negative slant to it. Remember, he, he is writing at a time that's many centuries before the incarnation of Christ, Possessing at that time, though the wisest man ever, only a bare scant knowledge as compared to what all of us know now about the life-giving plan of God through the grace displayed in the work of Jesus Christ. And so Solomon also, though, at various points, and particularly here in these final couple chapters that we delve into today, he, he just like suddenly flips to the, the other side of the emotional spectrum and encourages life to be lived with gusto and energy and joy. But even there, he'll kind of flip back just a click and say something that the reader, though, needs to live, though, in a way where he's cognizant of temporal realities, the hebel, the poof, the poof of life. So in a word, Solomon urges life to be lived well but to be lived by, well by living in the word with wisdom in life. And so as we live with wisdom, as we work our way through the, the, his final two chapters of advice, I think we can make four statements today about chapters 11 and 12 of Ecclesiastes about how we can live a wisely constructive life. And here's the first thing, is that we should live life with purpose. We'll see that in the first six verses here of chapter 11. In these verses, we're going to see that Solomon does indeed say, go for it. Go for it in life. Be passionate. Be energetic. Be active, not passive, even while remembering that uncertainties will always exist. He says this, ship your grain across the sea. After many days, you may receive a return. Invest in seven ventures, yes, in eight. You do not know what disaster may come upon the land. If clouds are full of water, they pour rain on the earth. Whether a tree falls to the south or to the north in a place where it falls, there it will lie. Whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. As you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. Sow your seed in the morning, and at evening let not your hands be idle, for you do not know which will succeed, whether this or that, or whether both will do equally well. 
in our associated online uh, devotionals that go along with our varied sermon series, I wrote this past week a little passage about the local battle of Antietam, noting a contrast in personalities between the two major commanding generals there, Robert E. Lee, of course, for the Confederacy, and George B. McClellan uh, for the Union. McClellan's shortcomings as a leader are often overemphasized and lacking in kind of a nuance of all the complexities that he did face. But it is true that it was his proclivity to not offer battle unless pretty much everything around him was just right and he kind of knew he was going to have success. And of course, you can't know that with much of life, especially in warfare. But Lee, on the other hand, was one who looked for opportunity to exploit at any moment. And more often than not, his aggressiveness would pay off well for him, although someone should have talked him out of that July the 3rd attack up there at Gettysburg, which was his major undoing. But, you know, I think overall, Solomon would like Lee's way of thinking and doing things, of looking for opportunity and going for it in life. Nothing ventured, nothing gained is a saying. You don't want to have paralysis by analysis. Solomon says you can't live that way off always fearful to act out of some fear of a fraction of unknowns. There will always be things that are unknown. So, you know, we often say, if you waited for the perfect financially secure time to get married, you'll end up dying as a single person. If you wait until the perfect time to begin family, you'll never have kids. If you wait for the perfect moment to invest, you'll never get your cash moved out of your checking account or from under your pillow. Or if you're like me and you can't find the perfect time to ever take a vacation, you'll never leave Downsville, all right? So that's life. Yeah, that's kind of how it is. But the picture in the first verses here is of a business venture that Solomon's picturing here. The concept as well of diversification. Ship your grain across the sea. He says, after many days, you may receive a return. Invest in seven ventures, yes, eight. You do not know what disaster may come upon the land. So he says, you've got to go for it. Yeah, get your grain, ship it across the seas, you know. You get the idea of a, a shipping venture. Uh, you, you might get a return, he says, or what's unsaid but is clear from it is or the ship might sink and you'll lose everything in a terrible storm. Uh, but don't put it all in one ship. Don't put it all in one venture. Don't only raise one type of grain is the idea. Diversify to avoid disaster, but make it happen. Go for it. Don't be idle is his wise advice. Because yes, there will be disasters. Clouds will bring rain, or not at all. But you can't sit around waiting for everything to be perfect if you're a farmer. I grew up in a very agricultural uh, a family, not my immediate family, but all my relatives, and surrounded in a, in a farm culture where I grew up in, in rural New Jersey, where there really is such a place. And uh, I can tell you from living around farmers almost every day of my life growing up that they are never really completely content about the weather situation and the way it's been. They're always upset about something about the weather. It's too much this or too little of that. But you know, it never stopped them from working. It never stopped them from getting out there and going for it. The weather that thwarts one crop may be perfect for another crop. So diversify, go for it. This is the wisdom of Solomon. You'll have to figure out how this applies to your unique circumstances and your work ventures and the things that God has given you as application for the energies of your life. But the big idea is to not be frozen in waiting for other things to happen, but to work, yes, responsibly, responsibly and wisely to make things happen. It won't be perfect, but it can be sufficient. So just do it. As Nike says, go for it, just do it. But here's a second thought, another balancing thought about the inevitable ups and downs of life. Uh, live life with peacefulness would be a second point we'd make today, verses 7 to 9, which say, Light is sweet, and it pleases the eye to see the sun. However many years anyone may live, let them enjoy them all, but let them remember the days of darkness, for there will be many. Everything to come is meaningless. Meaning, again, they're poof. It's a poof. The days ahead are pff, just coming and quickly going. You who are young, he says, be happy while you are young, and let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart and whatever your eyes see, but know that for all these things, God will bring you 
into judgment. We'll have a whole section on that thought as he fleshes it out in the next chapter. But then finally in last verse, chapter 11, so then banish anxiety from your heart and cast off the troubles of your body for youth and vigor are meaningless. You get what's that word meaningless mean? Youth and vigor are, they're gone. They're quickly here. They're quickly gone. Trust me, believe me, guys. It really is true. All right. Uh, so he says, banish anxiety. So banish anxiety. Go ahead. Go ahead. Do it. Do it. Just banish it. Get, get rid of it. Cast off all troubles. Isn't that great? They're, they're gone. <laughs> yeah. So how do you do that? How do you do banish anxiety? Well, I'm going to tell you, the lead pastor of this church called Tri-State Fellowship is going to right now tell you that he's not very good at doing this. But let me try to think of a few things that have helped a little bit here and there on this anxiety issue. Um, I, I, you know, I got out of high school. I went to nine consecutive years of college, double degree, five years, four years of seminary, so nine consecutive years full-time. And for the first seven of those years, I was super competitive. I know that's hard to believe. I was super competitive about tests, papers, grades, and uh, it, it was always hanging over my head, and I just had to get the best. I just had to bury everyone around me and, and make them cry because I beat them so bad. You know, that's the way I went at it. I would do, I would get all the information on the syllabi of the classes, and I'd lay it all out, and I'd make these giant charts, and I'd plan when I was going to do things, and, uh, but you know, all of that macro planning kind of stuff was a good preparation for life and work and, and all the other things that would come in life, but sometimes all the preparation in the world would not work for a specific test, and that's because, apologies to Nancy Thorpe and other professors in the room, professors are calibration idiots. I'm sorry, they just are. They're so smart, they're so brilliant, that they no longer understand and know what people many years younger than them who are just starting out, they don't know what others don't know. And they don't know how to put a test together sometimes. And so you get these crazy tests that didn't have any, that didn't make any you know, how would you possibly answer that? And you'd come out and you think, oh my, I was doing well in this class, but now it's a disaster. So you start asking around other students, what did you think? What did you think? And so what this taught me, not only what that, what I'm going to say, but it also taught me the real goal was to beat the other students, okay? <laughs> not the prof, but anyhow. But what it told me is that there were going to be bad days, beyond one's control. Not everything was going to be right. As he says here in the text, remember the days of darkness, for there will, there will be many of them. All you can do is your best, but you can do that, and you should do that and do your best. And so I learned after seven of those nine years that what I needed to do to cast anxiety away was to be responsible and do what I could do and beyond that, I wasn't going to worry about it. And I stopped worrying about grades, about whether I beat everybody else in the class, whether the grades were good, better, or best. And, and that really did. It really did help. Well, the principle here is to, yes, be responsible, work hard at the energies and things that God has given you, the, the, the things that he's put in your path. Do what's appropriate and right and just and leave the results, the rest of it, with God. And it has a way of tending to work out over time when you do that. So this whole section of peacefulness, it, I would put it this way, in our modern language, sometimes it just, it is what it is. It is what it is. Solomon didn't say that, but he wishes now that he did, because he would have liked that line. So be at peace with life in a world that's not always fair, that's far from perfect. Bad days in this world are not going to be rare. Sue Goldman, isn't that right? <laughs> bad days. She, if you ch check it with Sue, she had a bad day yesterday with cars and stuff. It's not going to be rare. Bad days are going to happen. Forrest Gump said something about how some stuff happens or whatever, something like that, as I recall. But, you know, it, what you do, you do what is right, you cast away anxiety about the rest of it. So live with Purposefulness with peacefulness as well. 
And then a third thing, live life with priorities. Turning over to chapter 12, the first eight verses here. Actually, this should probably say to live life with one big priority above all priorities, and that is to remember God, making him your first overarching priority. Here's what it says as we begin chapter 12. Remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the, the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dim and the clouds return after the rain, when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop, when the grinders cease because they are few, and those looking through the windows grow dim, when the, eye, when the doors to, to, of the street are closed and the sound of grinding fades, when people rise up at the sound of birds, but all their songs grow faint, when people are afraid of heights and of dangers in the streets, when the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags itself along and desire is no longer stirred, then people go to their eternal home and mourners go about in the streets. We're, we're going to come back to the final three verses here in a second, but let's talk about these first five verses. So the big idea here is to remember, as he says, first he says it, and he's going to say it again here in verse six. Remember God. Remember God early in life as a priority before one gets old. Remember God. Make that a priority. It's saying to not wait to make God a priority when the physical challenges of aging and the, 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 the cumulative despairs of life make the living of life more and more difficult. You need God early in life. You need God all through life. So don't delay. Whatever age you are, don't delay. Do it now. Make God a priority in life. And especially you'll be blessed if you do it when you're young. And then the verses go on to pictorially here in verses 2 and following to describe varied conditions of aging of the physical body. That's what's happening here. The first example speaks of when clarity of sight begins to fail. Speaking here of the, the idea of dimming lights of a little bit later, looking through the windows and how that grows dim. You know, there, there are few of us, few of us who can make it to the final decades of life with the great eyesight of our youth. And it can get to a point where we need the help of others to see everything clearly. Here's a story. Just, I saw this this week. It totally it cracked me up. A story of an elderly gentleman who loved playing golf all his life. But as he got older, his vision was, was really not good anymore. He could see the ball to hit it, but once it started out there ways, he, he, he had no idea where it went. So he always had had certain golfing partners and buddies who would play with him, and, and they would watch the ball so that uh, he would know where to go to find it to hit, hit the next shot. Well, one day, it was a beautiful day, his buddies didn't show up, and he was waiting at the clubhouse and just getting more upset and anxious because he wasn't going to get his round of golf in that day. And there was another elderly sort of fellow in the clubhouse and, and saw him and said, well, what's wrong? And, and the guy explained his predicament. I wanted to play today, but I, I can't see well enough to see where the ball goes. And my friends aren't, aren't, aren't here. And so the, the second man, who was even older, he said, well, well, I'll tell you what, that's no problem. He said, look, I'll be glad to, I'll be glad to ride around with you. I have 20-20 vision. Man, I can see like a hawk. And you just hit the ball, and I'll watch it fly down the fairway. So they get off to the first tee. The guy tees it up. He hits it, and the ball takes off down the fairway. And he looks at the second fellow, and he says, Okay, did, did you see where it went? went, where it went where'd it go? And the older fellow paused for a second. He said, Yeah, yeah, I saw it. Well, where'd it go? The guy says, I, I forget. <laughs> I forget. So there's multiple problems of aging, aren't there? It's not just the eyes of it. It's, that, it's not that. It's something else, you know? And so it goes through here in the following verses, and it lists in a pictorial way kind of some of the other things that can go wrong. It says the keepers of the house tremble. We believe that's talking about how arms and limbs grow weak, how the strong men stoop, kind of the spinal kind of thing that can happen as you age. When the grinders cease because they are few, that's the idea like losing, losing teeth. And then when people rise up at the sounds of birds, there's a sleeplessness thing that, that I'm sorry, Starting to notice kind of happens a little bit as you get older. And, and then about birds, their songs grow faint. That's the hearing thing begins to, to go. Well, 
You know, honestly, though, being still a relative youngster as I am, I, I've experienced few of these symptoms, but there is one here in verse 5 that it really hit me this, this week. Uh, uh, you know, the conversation you have with yourself, and myself said to myself, <laughs> Randy, that verse 5 there in chapter 12, you know what? You're that guy. You, you have become that guy about this issue that I'm going to, I'm going to tell you about here. And, uh, and that is, you know, I've talked in the recent years about how, since I can't run anymore because, you know, the, the, that verse 3 about knees, you know. All right, so I do the cycling thing instead. And I would cycle miles and miles and miles. And, but if you recall, this last winter was really a grievously cold winter, wasn't it? So I really didn't get out to cycle as much as I have in recent years. And then the spring decided it didn't want to come, and it kept going, and then, it, and then it started to rain like every day. And when it was nice, I always had some other problems. I really have only gotten in maybe like a third of the miles that I've ridden in other years, and I've, I've kind of lost some confidence. And uh, I've, other years, and I mean, I've always been, you know, just getting a bike, go out in the roads and, you know, be wise, but be out in the roads, it, it doesn't scare me. And but this year, I feel like I'm not, I'm not in the same condition as I was other years. I'm a little worried about it, and I found myself hesitant to get back out on the road. So what riding I did was always on trails and things like that. And I think, I've got to get over this. So I'm out riding the road. So I did a 17-mile loop. This was Thursday. I'm doing a 17-mile loop out on the road. And early in the ride, I got to thinking, you know what? This fear thing you've been dealing with, that's verse 5, chapter 12. You're that guy, afraid, as it says there, to go out in the streets. Afraid to go out in the streets. So I'm riding along, and and it's going pretty well. I'm making pretty good time. It's, It's a good ride. It's very nice. I'm heading back toward home. I'm like 14 miles into the ride. And uh, it's kind of downhill to home, and I'm thinking, wow, I'm, I, I'm, I'm all right. Yeah, I'm all right. I'm not afraid to go out in the streets. Everything is great. Everything is cool. I no sooner had that conversation with myself, back to myself, when suddenly it's like I felt like I was in the sand, and I looked down, and I had a Hebel situation with a back tire. Poof, okay, yeah, yeah, a flat tire. And I'm two miles from home. And I'm thinking, now how am I going to get home? I called Diana. She wasn't anywhere nearby. So I'm, I'm, okay, I'm going to have to walk home. And that means walking down my narrow street. This is what my road looks like. It's a country road. There's no shoulder, you can see. So I'm two miles. So I'm walking there on the right, bike on the, my, to my left on the white line. I'm walking in the weeds. And, uh, and then as I go a little further, next picture, I stepped on something. I literally stepped on the dumb thing, all right? Life is falling apart. So I go a little further down the road, and there's this spot where, if you've been on my road, damn number four road, there's this spot where there's there's some folks have a house. They have the old stone walls that were built there hundreds of years ago by slaves, and but they got just an opening. It goes back to, to their house. And I'm going down the road, and the lady gets out of the car, and literally five dogs jump out of the car. Uh, all sizes, different breeds and sizes, and they come running down the driveway toward me. They're going to eat me. <laughs> and I'm looking, and there's a truck coming up the road. The truck can't see the dogs. The dogs can't see the truck. They're not interested. They just want to eat me. So the dogs are coming, and the truck goes just, I mean, that much difference. It would have run the dogs over. And, uh, and I'm yelling, no, stay. And I, so I'm like, oh, I'm upsetting everybody else. I shouldn't be out here on the streets, you know, and I'm feeling really bad. And I'm almost, you know, back to my neighborhood. And Kristen Kraft passes me in a car with Kate Berry, her mom. And she says, hi, coach. Hey, you need a ride? And, well, I'm almost home now, you know. So, yeah, I would have needed a ride back up the road there. But... <laughs> I'm out on the streets, and then so, so I kind of I kinda get the idea there. It's poof, poof. Yeah, it's, it, it gets scary. So remember the point. Remember God. Remember God before you get to these times of life and so forth where, where it's just, you know, you can't keep up with everything around you. Here's the final three verses here at this point. Remember him before the silver cord is severed, before the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring and the, the wheel broken 
at the well and the dust returns to the ground it comes from the spirit returns to god who gave it meaningless meaningless says the teacher everything is <laughs> meaningless so solomon uses references here to the two common pictures of life throughout scripture the idea of light and of water whether light gives life water gives life the the cord breaking of the golden bowl it's a bowl of light is the idea when that goes out when the water wheel breaks the well when that goes out it, so it's pictures of death and the idea of dust here is looking back to the the curse from back in genesis when life goes poof poof says solomon everything is just a wisp of breath and now we stretch to the final line here, the final six verses that talk about the, the author and the truth of his words. They also give us one final overarching statement of wisdom about how to live well. And the fourth point here is live life with perspective. With perspective, verses 9 to 14. Not only was the teacher wise, but he imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. So in this sort of final paragraph here, Solomon gives his process of using the gift of wisdom as the teacher with a goal of talking about the ups and downs of life and proverbial statements. Statements. Again, statements, when you understand proverbial statement, it's not, thus saith the Lord. It, it's, no, it's kind of, this is what I observe. This is, the, this is a general truth about what can be observed in life. And so he gives these statements, and they contain truth. Not a thus saith the Lord truth, but uh, they contain truth. And they're written in a way of excellence, finding the best words for communication, it says. And then, verse 18, the words of the wise are like goads, they're collected sayings, like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Of making many books there is no end, and much study wearies the body. See, I needed this verse back when I was in school. But here's some words of wisdom from Solomon. He asserts that wise words hold life together in the same excellent way that well embedded nails hold it together the idea of goads you know in the old when you got the animal leading the ox or whatever leading the cart the goad is that stick that the farmer is using to prod the person along to give direction and that's what wise words are that's what the scripture words are these words it says from one shepherd the speaking of the divine source of the one shepherd these are wise words and they are a, a, a prod for us a goad a, a directive for us in life he says, but there's other shepherds out there for sure. There are many books out there of saying how to do this and how to do that. But ultimately, there's a priority of one. Keep this perspective of one shepherd and divine source. And then the final words, when all has been heard, here is the conclusion of the matter. I like this when a guy brings it to one point. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing whether it is good or evil. So putting it all together, though life will have ups and downs, futility, injustices, the duty of man is to keep God and his truth as the central focus for duty and obedience. And doing so will bring about a life that has a general pattern of success and reward and contentment. Uh, and there's judgment, though, that falls on those who choose otherwise. So the question comes to us is when do we make God the priority in our lives? When do we do that? The answer is, of course, for everyone in the room, whether you're 93 years old or whether you're 12 or 13 years, whatever it is, make God today. Start now, if you haven't, to make God the priority in life, his teaching, his word, his ways, his directive, his prodding your communication, your walk with him. Make that the priority of life. And the, if you're more younger than older, uh, man, it will really pay big, big for you if you do this. And if you're older than younger and you didn't do it, you know, Solomon wrote, better late than never. Well, he didn't, but he would have. <laughs> he would have. <laughs> no God. Walk with him. Talk with him daily. Life, albeit short, does not work without God. So to many of you, I say, 
as there are people in this room, you, you hesitate. I, I see it in some, you hesitate to really make God and honoring him and his people and serving him, you, you're, you're not quite sure you want to give it all over there. You're not quite sure you want to invest it all over there. Don't be crazy. Your life's not going to work without it. So don't put it off. Go for it. Go for it. There's peaceableness in the difficulties of life. That's the priority to make. That's the perspective to have. And you can live life successfully. Maybe you want to do that today as we turn to a time of communion. Maybe today you want to say, God, I've never really given it all over, and I'm going to do it right here now. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the truths that we have that have been given to us in this wonderful writing. It's a bit difficult sometimes for us to understand, whoa, that's, that was a really different statement there, but we put it all together. We see indeed that life is short, that it has its ups and downs, but our life to have success needs to be founded and sourced in you and your strength. Help us to go in that direction, each of us personally, by your spirit, do that work in lives today. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.